I am joined now by woodworker and my former speech teacher, Tom Pabst. Mr. Pabst. Hi, Emily. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. I was telling you before we started, all these years, I had no idea yeah. that you were a woodworker. Yeah, that, that was kind of a, a well-kept secret maybe when, when I was teaching, but. Uh, yes, but, but in reality, it was just as important, if not more so, than your teaching career. Exactly. Tell exactly. me about it. Um, I've always believed you have to find your passion. And for me, there were two things. One was teaching and one was working with wood. And the reason for that is because I had two really great teachers in, in high school. I had a phenomenal teacher who taught English, speech, drama. And his passion was just unbelievable. Francis May was his name. And I thought, wow, would I like to do that? And so I knew early on I wanted to be a teacher and I knew I wanted to teach English and be involved in speech and drama. Mm -hmm. At the same time, my father was a home builder. And uh, he, uh, early on, uh, captured my attention and, and created the passion in me. He told me that uh, he had me on barn roofs when I was five years old. And I'm sure my mother was very thrilled with that. <laughs> but uh, I have pictures of me at home. Uh, a kid normally plays in a sandbox. Yeah. And I have pictures where I'm at that sandbox using it as my workbench. I'm pounding nails into boards and I'm <laughs> sawing and doing all kinds of things. Yeah. So uh, as my high school years went by, um, my dad started teaching me everything he knew about home building, and he knew a lot. There are two things he did not teach me, electrical and plumbing. Mm -hmm. Everything else he taught me, siding, flooring, framing, trimming, drywall, painting, you know, building cabinets, and, and I just loved it. So um, I, I developed those two passions, and it was like, wow, I'm going to have to give one up, you know, probably. Mm -hmm. Ten years into my teaching career, I, I, I was making that decision, and I thought, this is going to be tough. And then I, then I got to thinking, and I thought, well, wait a minute. Why can't I do both? Teaching is the perfect profession, which allows me in the summertime to do the woodworking, to do the, the, the home building. And uh, so that's what, I, that's what I resigned myself to, and I absolutely loved it. And uh, did that all the way uh, through until uh, I retired from teaching. Uh, at which point I decided, okay, now I'm going to go in the more creative direction with the woodworking, smaller, because I didn't want to lift heavy lumber anymore. And uh, that's when I really started getting serious about the artistic side uh, of the woodworking that I do. Was it a steep learning curve or did you really catch on right away? I caught on right away, I really did. Uh, I mean, there were some things that, that I didn't do for, for several years, obviously, some things that were pretty difficult. Uh, one of the things I, 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 I can mention as an example, I had not used a lathe uh, prior to get going in this direction. And once I learned how to use a lathe, most, guy, most guys are turning a piece of wood, a chunk of wood, a sure. log, and, and making a bowl or a, or a vase out of it. But I thought if I could go into the segmented turning, which I had seen some of in, in magazines, if I went into that direction, it would give me a lot more creativity. Uh, and so um, I started doing uh, segmented work, and then I thought, wow, to make it really different, let's do open segments. So that means that every segment in that vase or bowl is going to have a space between it and the next segment. Mm. And uh, that, was, uh, that was a little uh, challenging because the I think the first 10 pieces I did, three of them blew up in my face. Just because if you get caught in one of those open sections with yeah. your tool, it's bang, you know, like that. But I really loved it. And I was able to add color. I, I, I love working with color. And so I would take uh, woods from South America, Central America, Africa, North America, uh, the Middle East, and, and randomly put those in my pieces. Mm -hmm. And it would give that pop, you know, that flash of color. Where and, do you uh, source that wood? Uh, I have a place just north of Kendallville. It's called Weibel's that uh, imports it just for those of us who like to include that in, in oh, our work. Wow. Uh, prior to that, I was getting some in St. Louis because there's a, there's a company in St. Louis that, that imports for guitar makers, and so mm -hmm. I would get some there. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, you can find it. Tell me about the design process. How do you go about deciding what you want a piece to look like, and does it evolve throughout the process, or do you have a set idea and? Uh, it depends. It depends on the piece I'm doing. Uh, I'm a big fan of nature. I just love nature. I've, I've always lived out in the country. So much of what I make is based on 
my reaction to nature. And uh, in many cases, I sketch it. Mm. I'll do a sketch. And uh, I'll give you one example. I thought I would make a tree. And so I drew on paper this tree, and I wanted it to be a jewelry box. And so I put all the branches in, and at the end of the branches were, you could say, leaves. And I, I made those so they, they would be drawers that you could pull out mm. uh, for jewelry. And, and I was really happy with that, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And the more I looked at it as time passed, I thought, wait a minute, that's not like trees are in nature. You know, you've got this straight trunk, and depending, on, depending upon the environment, you know, the trunk might turn, it sure. might have a dog leg in it. So I thought, let me do that, let me, let me do that and see what happens. So I drew another one, and I was happier with that. And then I thought, what if I did that more radical, you know, a turn? And so I did, and I was almost off the paper. And I thought, well, I gotta bring this back. And as I brought it back, this Bible verse comes into my head, John 15, which says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Mm. Not to bring religion into this, but, but I grew up in, in uh, parochial schools, and so I have a lot of that up here. Sure. And um, so I thought, wow, well, that would be cool, you know? And so I got it like this, and when I took it up to the top of the page, I thought, let's invert it and bring it around like this. And one of my favorite pieces is what I call my vine, mm. because it go and, and it started out as a tree, and now all of a sudden it's not a tree at all. And so it, it really evolved, and, and uh, it's just one of my favorite pieces. Do you ever get to a point in the midst of a piece where something goes wrong, or there's a knot, or, and, and you have to just change course? Yeah, I love working with woods that have knots and, and uh, very different grain and different colors in them. But I'll, I'll give you another example of, of, of uh, where I have to change course. Um, a friend of my neighbor had a uh, red cedar tree go over in his yard. Mm. And he starts cutting the branches off and takes them back to his burn, burn pile. He's going to burn them up. And, and at coffee one morning, he says to my neighbor, I wish I knew somebody who could use this red cedar tree. I don't want to burn it. <laughs> and she says, uh, I have a neighbor. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that started it. She gave me his phone number, and I called him, and I got the, I got the tree. And... Um, so I started, I started making bases and bowls. Well, you, you, you cut on the lathe, if you're doing a one-piece um, uh, vase or bowl, you, you cut when the, w the wood is wet mm. because it cuts easier. And so I, was, I, was, I made about three or four vases, and then you have to set them aside. Uh, they have to dry before you can put a finish on them. And as they're drying, and this is over the course of maybe two months, you know, I keep checking on, on them for dryness and so on and so forth, and all of a sudden, Wow, one of them cracks. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger when wood dries, it can crack. Mm -hmm. And I have done things in the past, like I would take uh, leather lacing maybe, you know, and, sure. and I would drill some holes beside the crack and I would lace it up so it would look like a shoe or some, a shoestring mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that, you know, and that was cool. But I had done enough of that and I thought, what else can I do? And I had it on my mantle for a while and it was a really cool vase, I thought. I thought, I can't sell it like that. I've got to do something with it or keep it myself. And a friend of mine was over at the house, and I pointed it out to her, and I said, see my cracked vase? And she looks at that a little bit, and she says, why don't you make that crack whiter and put a zipper in it? I thought, you're kidding me. No, that would look cool. I said, well, where am I going to get a zipper? And she says, Joanne Fabrics. Yeah. You know? So I measured the length of the crack. I went to Joanne Fabrics, and I got a zipper. And I came back, and it probably took another two or three weeks for me to get up the nerve yeah. to try to cut that so that a zipper would fit in it. And I flared it at the top, you know, so the zipper would look sure. like it was open. And that became my zipper vase. And it was like, whoa. So all of the rest of them, even though they didn't have cracks in them, I put zippers in. I was going to ask. Really cool. Yeah, did you, you know? so you started recreating. Oh, yeah. It was a very yeah. happy accident. Yeah. From that one accident came that whole idea. Yeah. Uh, with coaching, of course, and recommendation from my friend. Yeah. And um, uh, that very first one I gave to her because mm. she's the one that started that ball rolling. I had one lady say, uh, I like all your jewelry boxes because I do a lot of those, but they're, they're too complex. They're too, you know, the drawers are too small. I have a six-year-old girl who I'm now um, buying jewelry for. Could you design for her a mm. jewelry box that would be appropriate? And I thought, oh, okay. And so I went home and I thought, okay, it's got to be, the, the drawers have to be bigger. It has to maybe be sweeping and so on and so forth. And then again, going back to nature, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, what about a skier coming down the mountain? You know, and I, so I penciled the paper and I did that. And that gave me those really nice drawers. Mm -hmm. And I put nice long uh, uh, 
handles on them so a little a little girl could easily pull sure. them out and put them back in and that's how that came that came about just because someone said uh, I have a six-year-old daughter would you maybe think about doing something for her you know and so you know when you're a little kid and you don't realize that your teachers have lives outside yeah, of the exactly. classroom yes. I feel like that was the case with me and I'm embarrassed because I was in high school so it should have occurred to me that you know you were doing more I, than teaching but we, we all feel that I think I felt the same thing you know when when I, when I was in high school it was like wow these people have lives outside of these rooms yes you know? well um, I, I I dare say that you had a more interesting life than a lot of my teachers so um, thank you so much for coming in today your work is gorgeous and I hope to catch up soon let's not wait okay <laughs> years great great, great. <laughs> thank you Tom Thanks, no, Emily. I can't, I can't call you Tom. I have Thank about, you, Mr. Pat. I have about two students who will call me Tom. <laughs> I can't do of it. Of all the thousands I've had, <laughs> most of them will still say Mr. Pat. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Pat. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. Arts in Focus on PBS Fort Wayne is funded in part by The Hour Foundation and the Community Foundation of Greater Fort Wayne.